Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. You know, this is a program where we are deeply interested in the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. I can't say it often enough. I can't say it emphatically enough. The Bible is God's Word. God spoke every word in the original languages, and and it was written down very accurately. And what we have, therefore, in the original Hebrew of the Old Testament and Greek of the New Testament is word by word exactly what God wants us to have. Therefore, we, the job of the translator is to be as faithful as possible to that original language. And while we can check out the translator and sometimes... And not very often, but once in a while find that a word could have been better translated. We never, never question the original language because we know that is from the mouth of God. And it is dependable and accurate and trustworthy and true, even though it may be uh, very frequently, as a matter of fact, very difficult to understand. But then we patiently pray for wisdom and patiently follow the biblical prescription of comparing Scripture with Scripture. And we look for the spiritual meaning of the words that are employed in that particular verse. And once in a while, God will give us truth. And then as we build more and more knowledge of the Bible and how God wrote it, more and more of the Bible will be understood. And that's what Uh, That is what we are trying to teach, that which we have understood from the Bible. Now, we have a listener in uh, Canada, in Canada, a shortwave listener, who's asking uh, about a question from the book of Job. Uh, Job, you know, is not an easy book to, uh, to understand, but we must keep in mind that it is a historical parable. That is, it is a what, what is said and done and written about here in the book of Job actually did happen, but it is spiritually pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ who was typified by Job. And the, and the three friends who, who uh, are, also spoke again and again Uh, They are not understanding uh, exactly what Job is going through. They're making very definite, true statements, but sometimes their application to Job is not as accurate as it should be. So, we finally read in Job 42, and here is the question. Uh, uh, In Job 42, verse 10, it says that when Job prayed for his friends... These were the three friends, Eliphaz and Zohar and the other one, uh, that the Lord changed the circumstances of Job's life. What does this mean? Well, the verses in question are Job 42, and we read in uh, verse 7, And the Lord said, Jehovah said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee. And against thy two friends, that would have been Zophar and Bildad. But ye have, for ye have not spoken to me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. And then we read in uh, verse 9, So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, went and did according as Jehovah commanded them, and the Lord also accepted Job. And Jehovah turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, Jehovah gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, this is a key phrase. He turned the captivity. Uh, Not always, but very, very frequently in the Bible, when we see turn the captivity, it has to do with becoming saved. Before we are saved, we are captives of sin. We are under the captivity of sin. We're under the captivity of Satan. And 
when we and we are under the wrath of God, and when we become saved, we are we become bond servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why we read in Ephesians chapter four that Christ went to the lower parts of the earth, that is to hell, in order to bring us out. He found us in hell. Uh, that is, to be in hell is to be under the wrath of God. And he brought us forth out of hell as his captives. Now, the Lord Jesus himself had to endure hell. That was typified by Job. He had everything at the beginning. He was perfect before God. The language is given. And, and yet everything was taken away from him. He was stripped of everything, his family and all of his wealth and so on. And uh, then, finally, when he it comes to the end of that experience, uh, we read that he prayed for his friends, and God returned the captivity of Job, and he had twice as much as he had uh, when he was at the beginning. And that's a picture of Christ, who uh, had been enduring hell for our sins, and when he had completely fulfilled that, he was able to provide salvation like is typified by praying for these three friends. And, and uh, he himself had, had his, uh, was no longer under the captivity of sin. He no longer was under the wrath of God. He now was again restored as King of kings and Lord of lords and, and, uh, and uh, into all of his glory that he had before he went when before he came as uh, the savior and that is typified here by the language of job 42 where job was given a double everything that he had had at the very beginning but thank you uh, Canada for that question and now we're going to go to our first caller on our telephone lines good evening welcome to open forum how are you today, Brother Camping? Very well, thank you. Exodus 35, verse 3. Exodus 35, verse 3. There we read, Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Could, could you explain that? Are we to be obedient to that uh, now? I mean, you know, today? Oh, no. That, the seventh day Sabbath was a part of the ceremonial law system. In the Old Testament, God gave certain laws that were pointing to aspects of salvation. God gave commands concerning the offering of a sin offering. A lamb had to be killed. Blood had to be sprinkled. Uh, 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 and there were certain feast days had, that had to be observed, including the seventh-day Sabbath. Now the Lamb was pointing to Christ who would come. The, the sprinkled blood was pointing to the fact that he would have to give his life in order uh, to provide salvation. The seventh-day Sabbath was pointing to the fact that even as they were not to do any work at all on that day, like making a fire or uh, cooking something or or no any work of any kind, so we are not to do any work in order to try to achieve salvation. Uh, this we read in Exodus 31. God gave the seventh day Sabbath as a sign to show that I, the Lord, will sanctify thee. And so we don't we read the Old Testament language of the Sabbath day and and learn spiritually what uh, uh, how that applies and and we get uh, strength and and information that we're not to have any kind of a plan uh, thinking we have become saved because of some work that we have done we have to remember all the work was done by Christ but we do not observe the seventh day Sabbath anymore yeah, no, because in your book I saw you in using Isaiah 58, I believe 13. Now that, in Isaiah 58, the whole chapter is really talking about the New Testament Sabbath. 
Uh, oh. That is not the seventh day Sabbath. Uh, the, in fact, the, you'll notice that in Isaiah 58, it opens up with a, a great change in the meaning of fasting. In the Old Testament, to fast was to afflict oneself, uh, was to f- literally, physically fast uh, to uh, indicate that you are denying yourself of something. But then God goes on to indicate in Isaiah 58, this is the fast that I choose, that you uh, uh, feed the hungry and you clothe the naked and and so on and so on. All language that has to do with God's New Testament plan of evangelizing the world. And in that context, God's saying, and I have given you the Sabbath as a day to... Uh, to do my will. And this is a, a different Sabbath than the seventh day Sabbath. It is a Sabbath that is not pointing to something. It is a Sabbath that is assisting us in living out our life in this world. We, uh, uh, of course, in our day, in many, in some of our countries, we are very uh, fairly affluent and we uh, can work five days and earn enough to make a living. But historically, and in, in fact, it still exists in a great many portions of the world, a man has to work seven days a week from sun up till sundown in order to have enough food on the table, let alone have a TV or some of the uh, excesses that we have in our homes. And yet God says, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you are also have a spirit, and I, here is my plan. You are to set aside one day. And we know from the New Testament, it was shifted from the seventh day to the first day of the week, in which you are under no obligation to do any work. You, you should be do, thinking only about your relationship with me. In other words, here is a 24-hour opportunity for you to grow spiritually, to have time for prayer, time for uh, meditation on the Word of God, time for sharing the gospel with others. And you will not be stealing from your family. You will not be neglecting your responsibility to care for your family. Uh, this is my plan for mankind. Uh, I, I was also concerned with First Samuel fifteen twenty two through twenty four. That's when Saul uh, disobeys the voice of the Lord. I wanted to know if this had any impact on the uh, people today that are disobedient to God's word, and you know they 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 want to please the people really instead of. Uh, you know, fearing the Lord. Well, and being as, a, as a matter of fact, this particular incident in the life of Saul uh, was an enormously uh, description, uh, uh, descriptive of what happens when we go our own way. Uh, God, uh, uh, Samuel came to Saul and and uh, 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 said. Now, therefore, I pray thee, in verse, tw- no, in verse 26, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return unto thee, for thou hast rejected the word of Jehovah, and Jehovah hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And, and so it was a serious con- consequence of his rebellion. And that is a very frank reminder to all of us, if we insist on going our own way, we want to do what we want to do, we are not going to have any blessing from God. We are not, uh, we are, God may just let us go. And, uh, and it's, we, we should recognize it's an enormous privilege that God gives us to come to him and cry to him for mercy and, and try to seek him as best we can, hoping that maybe someday he will even save us. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Nice to uh, talk with you again. I have a question. Or I was interested in the in Luke 
chapter 21, 7 to the end of the chapter, the uh, end time discourse Jesus had with his disciples. Does that time period cover from the beginning of the church to where we are right now? Let's look at that. Luke 21, beginning in verse, which verse? Uh, 7 to the end of the chapter. Does that time frame encompass uh, the beginning of the church to where we are right now? That whole time frame. Uh, No, no, excuse me, excuse me. Look at verse 5. That is really setting the, the giving a setting of what is going to follow. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in which shall, there not, shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, what, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And then God Christ goes on and describes what will be the evidence that we've come to this point when there's not one stone left upon another. And that we know when studying the Bible very carefully, uh, God is talking about the temple, the church age, uh, spiritually, we have been building the temple of God. Christ is the foundation. And, and as we have been sharing the gospel in the world throughout the church age, those who have become saved have, uh, or thought they had become saved, in either case, they have become building blocks in the temple. Remember in 1 Corinthians 3, they're spoken of as gold, silver, and precious stones. They would be the true believers that actually became a part of the temple of God, of the kingdom of God. And then there was also wood, hay, and stubble. They were were the ones who also became building blocks in the temple, but they were not the true believers. And that has been going on throughout the church age. But then... When the end of the church age ended, and we know from the biblical calendar that in all likelihood that was in the year 1988, God finished with the temple, and he left the temple so that it was destroyed. That is, it no longer the churches, which were the te- externally representing the kingdom of God, spiritually were the temple, no longer are the temple. They uh, it that is gone. No stone is left upon another. And then, uh, in, as we go on in Luke chapter 21, God gives us the situation in the world and in the churches when this is uh, uh, because this has happened. This is the sign that this has happened. And he's talking about those who come in the name of Christ. That is, there are all kinds of people who claim to be true believers and and coming in the name of Christ with the authority of the Bible, and yet they are not coming with the gospel of the Bible at all. And it, and it goes on and talks about uh, 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 other things that will be happening right up until the very end. This is really talking about the final day of judgment, the final 23 years of the history of the world and at the time in which we presently are. Wasn't that the early church when they were persecuted? Well, there's always been some persecution. There's always been uh, uh, tribulation, like we read in John 16. In the world, you you will have tribulation. Uh, that's that has been going on, but the context of Luke 21 is uh, set in the early verses, and uh, God is explaining in Luke 21, as He does in Matthew 24, as He does in Mark 13, what will be the characteristics of this period of great tribulation in which we are presently living, and that. Those three chapters are particularly focused on our day. Yes, I agree. But what about that part in Luke 21 when Jesus says, but before, these, but before this or but before these, 
It seems like um, that means he's talking about the, the oh, church well. age and then at the uh, abomination of desolation, then that's our time. That's possible. That's possible that some of these verses do relate to what is typical throughout the history of the world. In other words, our God is uh, making sure by that language that we do not look for what is happening politically that is insofar as wars are, 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 are concerned, nor are we looking at, uh, at uh, the natural disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes and so on to see if that somehow is a sign of his coming. Yes, that, that, the language indicates this when he says, before all of this. What does um, the pregnant women uh, stand for, and what are the, who are the armies surrounding Jerusalem? Well, the, see, the fact is that in this day, Satan has occupied the churches, he is ruling there, and he is making his final assault on trying to get the final victory over Christ. Uh, now, he won't get the victory, but he has, uh, looks like he has won an enormous victory. Actually, God placed him there. It wasn't because of the strength or the wisdom of Satan or uh, anything, but, uh, but he has become the spiritual ruler of all of the churches that are sprinkled all over the world and that's an enormous uh, victory and and therefore he is uh, is opposed to anyone in the churches who is trying to remain faithful to the word of god he's driving them out uh, that's why uh, many people have been excommunicated or are forced to leave because are are told they cannot uh, teach their ideas anymore because they're not wanting to be faithful to what that church is teaching. And, uh, and that is the way Satan is assaulting the true believers. What about the pregnant women? Why, why does Jesus say, uh, woe to pregnant women and mothers who are nursing? Well, the, that is a pickup from when we read back in, in, uh, in uh, the days of, of Judah, when they were destroyed by the Babylonians and uh, you know today for example and this is the uh, modern uh, version of this today here is uh, here is a family that their spiritual eyes have not been open they don't realize that Christ no longer is the spiritual ruler of this of this fine upstanding biblical church they believe and and so lovingly they are and trustingly they are taking their children uh, there and uh, and praying oh lord could it be that my child too might become truly saved and truly a, a child of god and yet they are bringing their children and mothers are bearing children in an in a, in, a, in an area where there is no possibility of salvation. None. There's nothing so horrible that has ever been in the world, that there is an area in the world today, namely the local congregations, where there is no possibility of salvation. And Christ alludes to this in the language of the Old Testament, back in Lamentations, which was a lament that was uh, uh, identified with the, with the uh, destruction of Judah uh, when it was typifying this time of our day. And we read in, in, uh, in uh, Lamentations chapter, uh, chapter 2, chapter 2, uh, in verse 11, Mine eyes do fail me, or excuse me, mine eyes do fail with tears. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people because the children and the suckling swoon in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, 
Where is corn and wine? You see, corn and wine has to do with the true gospel. It's not there anymore because God is not applying that word to anybody's heart. They, where is corn and wine when they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was poured out into their mother's bosom? You see the tra- tragic trauma that is going on. Here are these families that are preparing and guaranteeing their children will end up in hell as long as they keep them in the churches because there's no possibility that God will apply the word of God to them there. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Mr. Campion, I had a question on uh, as far as the church age is over. Uh, when I don't have the Bible in front of me, so I, I, I can't tell what, what which book it is. But when Jesus uh, asked the apostles who uh, who they think Jesus is, and when Peter came out and he said he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and Jesus granted him. Uh, Power, or yeah, I guess there would be power uh, over uh, the domain of heaven and earth, and and how bound on earth. When you said, uh, "Whoever you say shall be held down in heaven, shall be held down on earth; whoever you say shall be held down in earth, shall be held down in heaven." Uh, is that the power that Jesus gave to Peter, or was that just a metaphor he used, or? Is, that mean, is, uh, you're quoting from Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. Let me read what Christ said, or what the Bible says. And of course, Christ is the Word of God. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, and the rock is Christ, not Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he's talking here not about the local congregation, uh, uh, the physical church, uh, but he's talking about the eternal church. Hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We're looking at Matthew chapter 16, and uh, Jesus is, uh, is uh, saying to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that is Christ, I will build my church. And the church that Christ is to build is not the local congregation. Uh, We can tell that from the next phrase. But it is the eternal church. Everyone who becomes a true believer, truly becomes born again, truly receives a brand new resurrected soul, they become an eternal member of the church of Christ, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against these individuals because there is no sin that they still have to answer for. All of the sins of these individuals have been already covered by Christ uh, paying for them by enduring the wrath of God on their behalf. Now, the local congregations, they have some individuals like this within them, but they have many terrors. They have many who look like true believers and are not true believers. And and the local congregations, they can come and go. Uh, They can last for a while and disappear, and then God raises up some others and so on. That is not in view. And then he says to the true believers, as he's speaking to Peter as an illustration, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That is, a key is used to open a door. A door. And uh, there are two doors that are open when someone becomes a believer. There is the gate of hell. They are taken out of hell. And they are brought in. They, they are, the, the, or the gate is open into heaven. And as we bring the gospel, as we bring the gospel, God takes people and, and, uh, who are spiritually dead and he 
uh, gives them a new resurrected soul. He makes them citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And that's why he says, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall... And the verb tenses are very important right here. They were not carried through to the English. They should have, it should have read this like this. Uh, and whatsoever is bound, thou shalt bind on earth shall having been bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall having been loosed in heaven. In other words, the prior action uh, of whatever is going on on earth was, was accomplished by God altogether, and we are simply seeing the result of that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping? Yes. Um, um, I would like to ask you two questions. Um, was when God made Adam, did, did Adam have a holy soul, soul? Was he saved? We have no knowledge. God does not instruct us as to whether Adam or Eve did become saved. Uh, the, the, the possibly did become saved. We know that they brought up Abel in the fear and the nurture of the Lord. Abel certainly, their second son, became saved. But uh, but that whether they they themselves became saved, it did not God's serve God's purpose to disclose that to us. But I mean, like when when he was made, when God made him, did he made him save you know holy with a holy oh, spirit? Oh well, now we can't use the word saved because we are saved from the wrath of God because of our sin. When Adam and Eve were created, there was no sin. They were created perfect. They did not need salvation. They were without sin, uh, but it was conditional. If they did rebel against God, and they did, then they would come under the wrath of God, and once they became under the wrath of God, then they had to become saved, just as any one of us have to become saved. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Camping. Yeah. Hey, my question is about the, uh, the, uh, the man who was created uh, like, uh, well, to the image of God. The names of God? The man, the man. In Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 23. No, 26. <clears throat> verse 26. Verse 23? No, 26. Oh, 26. Yes. And God said, Let us make man in <clears throat> our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, what is your question about this verse? If the, if the man is made, uh, well, to the image of God, and yeah. uh, do the man is uh, body, soul, and a spirit? Well, you know... We're created in the image of God. Uh, Christ or God did not have a physical body. Uh, he was, we read, God is spirit. He was totally a spiritual being. To be created in the image of God and the likeness of God, therefore, did not include that Adam and Eve, uh, who were the beginning of the human race, and therefore the whole human race, were created with a body. But Adam and Eve were also, as all mankind, were given a spiritual part of their personality called a soul or called a spirit. Sometimes it's called the heart. These are all synonyms for the same thing. And, and in that part of our of their life, 
they were created in the likeness of God. That is why mankind can think in terms of God. That's why we can have some understanding of the words that God uses as he has given us the word of God. Animals can't do that. They do, were not given a spiritual uh, essence or spiritual part of their personality. All they are is a body with the breath of life. We have a body with the breath of life, so in that area of our personality, we're very, very similar to the animals. But additionally, we have a soul or a spirit essence, and in that part of our life, we were created in the image of God. In uh, chapter 2, verse 7. In uh, chapter 2, verse 7, and, the, and Jehovah God formed a man of the dust of the ground. Uh, that's, that's talking about his body. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. There is when he receives a soul, a spirit essence. And man became a living soul. He, he, uh, he uh, would never die if he didn't rebel against God. He would be like God going on throughout eternity future. Okay, but uh, I mean, the soul, uh, as your uh, definition, the soul and the spirit is the same? Well, in the Bible, God uses the word, these words, uh, uh, sometimes speaking about different things. We have to look at the context. Sometimes God uses the word soul, and he's talking about our whole personality, body and soul. Sometimes he uses the word soul and is only using speaking about our spirit essence, that spiritual part of our personality. God uses the word spirit. Sometimes, normally speaking about our the spiritual part of man, but once in a great while, he'll use the word spirit uh, to emphasize or speaking about the breath of man, the fact that we have breath. And so we have to each time look at the context in which these words are used. But thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, I also want you to read, if you can, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. I, I'm sorry, what book? Proverbs. 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 Yes. Yeah. Chapter. Twenty. Twenty. Verse twenty-seven. Yeah. Verse twenty. Proverbs. Uh, uh, cha uh, what? What chapter and verse? Chapter twenty, verse twenty-seven. Twenty, verse twenty-seven. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's look at that. The spirit of man is the candle of Job, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Uh, and uh, the, uh, this, this is a, a place where God is speaking about the soul of man because the, the, uh, uh, it is through his soul that God is able to see all that we are, who we really are. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Caffey? Yes. Yes, I have a question that I'm more than happy to take off the air. Um, when we pray and we say in Christ's name, I pray, amen, can you explain that to me, please? Uh, I'm sorry, when we do which? When we pray... Uh, when we're praying to God, yes, and at the end of our prayer in closing, we say, in Christ's name I pray, or um, in Christ's um, name we pray, amen. Can you explain that for me, please? Why, yes. Well, you see, the, the, uh, the, the fact is, our right to pray, we have to think that this is an enormous accommodation of God to mankind because here is mankind created in the likeness of God and perfect and and mankind deliberately rebelled against God and that includes every single one of us and God ought to throw us all in the hell we all deserve it absolutely and yet he comes to us and says 
Now, when you pray, pray, Our Father who art in heaven. How can that be? How is it possible that we can uh, petition God for his mercy, that we can ask for strength from him, that we can uh, pray for this and, and, and thank him for that and so on? It's because Christ has come to, uh, to uh, uh, pay for our sins and has made it possible for us to be reconciled to God. And therefore, as we pray, we are reminding ourselves that indeed it is only because of the mercies of Christ and through his authority and, and his command. He's the one who commanded us uh, to uh, c come boldly to the throne of God. He is the one who has commanded us when we pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. And therefore, on his authority, that is in his name, now we come to thee, O God. And not because we deserve it or that we're entitled to it, but it's only because God, Christ has made it possible and has actually authorized us to come to God this way. And that's an amazing condescension on the part of God that he would allow us to do that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I haven't been able to get through to you for a long time, Mr. Camping, calling from New York City. Yes. Uh, I call because that gentleman before me, what he was asking is that when we pray, we, we pray through Jesus Christ because he's our intercessor. He's our advocate on the right-hand side. We don't pray directly to God. We pray through Jesus Christ. Well, but why would we do that when Christ has commanded us, when you pray, you pray our Father. Who oh, remember John 3:16 for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son who is the son the Lord Jesus who is the giver the father uh, and we read uh, later on in the bible that he the father is the giver of every good and perfect gift and here Christ has ordained it uh, ordained this and he has commanded us when you pray pray our father now, there are all kinds of people who have set up their own salvation plan and they have uh, their own ideas about how to approach God and what to pray for and how they're going to get saved and so on. And it and, and it's all sounds very, uh, very comfy and fuzzy and, uh, and lovely and nice. And, uh, but uh, that's not the way we come to God. We come to God based on what the Bible says. Oh, okay, I think you misunderstand what I'm saying. In other words, I pray to the Father, but I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, that's what the uh, caller was asking about. That's what right. I explained, that, he, that, that we come in the name of Jesus Christ. Right. Because on his authority, we dare to come to the Father. Yes, so I hope we have that to reconcile because now I'm a little more confused. Though, <laughs> in other words, um, you say our Father who are in heaven and so on and so forth, and then uh, but uh, what I do when I pray, I say I pray to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, and then I pray directly to the Father. Well, that is the way God has asked us to do. Although, you know, on the other hand, we find the publican praying, "Oh God, have mercy on me." The main thing is, is that we're praying very humbly and we're broken. And we don't come to God with our preconceived ideas about who God is or what he's supposed to do for us or anything else. We come very, very humbly and broken before him. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I hope to get you in the next 10 years. That's how long it's been. Thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Kemper, you have two questions. Uh, the first one being, um, how did religion start? How did religion start? Religion started because when God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. He created him with the law of God on his heart. And he created him uh, uh, with a conscience 
uh, even after man rebelled against God, uh, that uh, that he knew he had to be obedient to God. And so religion, uh, we could summarize every religion or put every religion into one a simple statement. It is man's idea that is every religion except the true religion, and there's only one, one true religion. But every religion except the true religion is man's idea of how somehow to become right with God in the face of the fact that he knows he's in trouble with God because he knows he's a sinner. He knows that he has to answer to God for his sins and the penalty is going to be awful. And so he's got to find some kind of a spiritual entity that he can become a part of that will give him assurance that if I am very devout in this particular religion or gospel, this will uh, enable me to, uh, to uh, uh, become right with God. And, and everyone is wrong uh, if it is not based 100% on the Bible and the Bible alone. And so all the uh, Eastern religions, uh, they, they will not get anybody right with God. All the religions that claim they use the Bible, like the Baptists or the Methodists or the Roman Catholics or the Jehovah Witness or whatever, they all have designed their own kind of a gospel, except they've utilized some of, more or less, of the Bible. But until we humbly or come to God only through a faithful understanding of what the Bible is and uh, that it is the law book of God and that we're de totally dependent upon God. We're not going to have a religion but which is going to get us right with God. So where does that, uh, Brother Cameron, where does that place the religions uh, and how should we consider the mythologies prior to uh, God's coming? Well, mythology and all, all of this it was, uh, it was all man's attempt. You see, man was created in the image of God. He knows there is a God. We read in Re Romans 2 that God's law is written on his heart, and he knows about sin. He knows there's a judgment day. He doesn't know it accurately, necessarily, but he knows that all of this does exist. And so... Uh, you can have very, uh, very uh, imaginative writers and, and philosophers who can write out a religious program of some kind that becomes the foundation of Mohammedanism or becomes the foundation of Mormonism or the foundation of, of any religion you want to name. And, and uh, 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 people can look at that and Yes, that looks possible. I, I like that. I, I, I want to be part of that. And so they become very, very uh, uh, devout yeah. parts of that. But none of them is going to suffice uh, to get people right with God unless it's, it is confined only and entirely to the whole Bible. And and that that's where we're going to find the true... Uh, the true religion uh, through which we can f uh, we can find uh, the path by which we are to uh, come to God as we plead for salvation. I'm very grateful for the ministry with uh, much integrity, Brother Camping. Thank, thank you for clarifying thank, that. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping? Yes. Okay. Oh. I wanted to um, quote a scripture here. It says, The Holy Spirit is only given to those that obey. So the whole thing in the nutshell is obedience to the Word of God. And uh, But anyway, those precious people that calls about the Sabbath, I wanted to say this, if I may, uh, the concern about the Word of God. They're all so precious, calling for more information. And well, you made a statement that the Sabbath was given to Miss White, Ellen G. White. 
But the Bible said that the Sabbath was given to the Jews, his people. It was never given to Miss White. I was just wondering. Well, I don't know what your what your question really is. Uh, the Sabbath, uh, God has given us the information in the Bible, and we have to search the Bible to know how to answer questions about the Sabbath altogether. Now, there are many, many people in the world, in fact, the majority people of the world, know nothing about the Bible. They've never looked at the Bible. They know nothing about a seventh-day Sabbath or anything else. But they have, uh, they are, most people have some identification with some kind of a religion because intuitively they know they, there is a God that they have to answer to and they uh, hope that the religion they're following will get them there. And uh, it's only when we start using the Bible as a uh, further input in designing a religion that we get into the uh, Sabbath question. And there, again, there are all kinds of people that are only reading the Bible partially. They're not looking at the whole Bible. They're drawing conclusions uh, that are not accurate at all because they're violating God's rules that they are to compare Scripture with Scripture and that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and so on. And so they end up just as as blinded, just as uh, defeated spiritually as those who don't have the Bible at all. But thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Camping. A uh, question on, on, Ma on the book of Matthew, chapter 21. Uh, sorry, uh, book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Matthew 7, verse... Yes, now in Matthew 7, verse 21, uh, God is really... Uh, giving us the awesome warning, and it's a horrible situation he's speaking about, that there are all kinds of people who were very confident in this life that they had found the true religion, the true religion through which uh, if they trusted it implicitly, they would become right with God, and it was not that it was not sufficient because it was not that faithful to the Word of God. And so God explains this in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And there are all kinds of people today who talk very freely about the Lord this and Jesus that and the Holy Spirit the other thing. And they seem to have an enormous familiarity with God and seem to be at peace with God. And yet here is the test. They sh uh, if it says, But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. In other words, the test is not how frequently we are talking about the Lord or to the Lord, not how... Uh, how uh, uh, we often we indicate how how we understand the scriptures and so on, <coughs> not on how much we think we know from the scriptures. Those are not the tests. The test is, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. In other words, it's obedience again. It ties right back into this theme that runs through the Bible that the test of a true believer is obedience to the Word of God, a brokenness and a, an intense desire. I only want to do Thy will, O Lord. And, and uh, this is a constant thing. It's not an on and off proposition. It's a constant it, thing as it, a result of the fact we received a new resurrected soul. But it does go on to say that uh, a little further, uh, verse 23, or I believe it's, probably just after verse 23, it says, Well, Lord, have we not done your will? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not fed the hungry? And, he, and then Jesus replies to them, I never knew you. Well, in other Part words, me. in other words, 
they have are convinced because they have been zealous and because they have uh, are, are trying to be faithful in bringing the word uh, uh, that they are a child of God, but God did not know them because they were never obedient to him. And so there they wake up at the judgment throne and find out When it's too late for salvation, no more mercy, no more salvation, that God says, depart from me. Where? Where? They're to be cast into hell. This is going to be a horrible, horrible confrontation that is going to be experienced by countless numbers of people. We have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to open forum. Hey, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. I've often heard you speak, and it's in either Proverbs or Psalms, about babies when they're estranged from the womb. Because I keep having conversations with people who talk about an age of accountability, and the Bible doesn't talk about that, does it? No, not a bit. Psalm 58 is what you're quoting from. Uh, uh, The wicked go astray from their mother's womb, uh, uh, speaking lies. And you see, the the, uh, fact is that every human being is by nature wicked. And so there is no baby that is born without sin. We're conceived and born in sin, we read in Psalm 51. And uh, so... Uh, we uh, every every human being uh, needs to have salvation. Now, the reason that the whole theory or the whole false doctrine of accountability that uh, that children until they're a certain age are are uh, are uh, not under the wrath of God that was uh, uh, that was fostered to cover up for a serious problem in another totally wrong doctrine that has been held, namely that we have to accept Christ to become believers. Well, a little baby can't accept Christ, so uh, how how is that going to work? And so then they concocted the uh, next uh, false doctrine, uh, because that first one also is false, that... uh, that uh, we have to accept Christ in order to become saved. That's totally false. And so they concocted the next one, that up until the age of accountability, and some say it's seven years old, some three years old or whatever, uh, that baby is innocent, and if it dies before it gets to that age, it automatically goes into heaven. The whole business is a man-made a theology that has no basis in the Bible whatsoever. And then one more question along that same line. What about uh, kids that are born with, like, brain disease? I mean, uh, the best that I could say, because I don't see anything like that in the but, Bible, is that but we just, don't know how God can God can reach anyone. Well, because see, we the, can't doesn't mean he can't. You see, actually, when we have a clear understanding, true understanding of God's salvation plan, we don't have these kind of problems because God uh, chose each and every one that he planned to save from the very foundation of the world. And in principle, from the very foundation of the world, he made payment for their sins. So regardless of how they come into this world, if they come without a, into this world without a brain or if they come with a very minimal brain or if they die in, at the moment of birth or, or even before they're born, uh, the fact is that if Christ had made payment for their sins, God uh, would have placed them somehow under the hearing of the word because that is the environment in which he applies the word of God and he would have saved that child with no, and you know there is no one in the you in the whole universe who is saved because I did something that's an impossibility we can plead with God we can beg of God we can hope that maybe God might have mercy but it is God 
who makes the decision of whom he has paid the sins for and he will apply that word of God to that person's life at his, in his timeline in his time uh, frame and and uh, we just uh, enjoy the blessings of that if and if we do become saved thank you you said that psalms 51 psalm 58 58 i'm sorry Verse brother Kim, thank you very much and have a great weekend yeah you're welcome good. thank you good night Bye. and shall we take our next call please Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, God bless you, Brother Howard Campen. Yes. Uh, my question is on regarding Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Right. All right, let's look at that. Hebrews 10, verse 25. That is a verse that is very, very uh, often misunderstood because even when it was translated, it was not uh, translated very well. Uh, we read in Hebrews chapter 10. Let me turn to that a moment. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Now the verse reads, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as... as uh, uh, the uh, manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Actually, there are words placed into this translation that are not part of the original. You don't find a word together. You do not find the word uh, 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 one another. That is not there. Actually, this verse is saying, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting or comforting. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, actually, when we examine the Greek words that are used here, that word assembling is defined in by its use in one other place in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, where God talks about uh, assembling together uh, at the time that Christ comes. And we know from other parts of the Bible that we, Christ does not come for us in group, as we are assembled together as groups of people, but he comes for us one by one. Two are in the bed. One is taken. The other is left. Two are working at the mill. One is taken. The other is left. So the word assembling is not talking about a group of people. It's assembling, uh, it's assembling uh, in the context of what is being said. Here, for example, it is assembling of ourselves. Who do we assemble with? Well, we assemble with Christ. Uh, we do not, there's nothing in the Bible that says after the church age we are to assemble in groups of people. And then again, comforting or exhorting. Uh, who do we comfort? Well, the context is ourselves. We comfort ourselves. How, where is our comfort? Well, through the Lord himself. He is our comfort. And that's what that verse is saying. And, and the context of this verse is very clearly talking about our day that uh, that this is and this very strange language is very strange language to assemble of ourselves uh, if it were thinking if it were teaching that we were to assemble as a group of people it would you would think it would say assembling of the congregation or assembling of the church or assembling of uh, of what of several people but no assembling assembling ourselves curious language but it is fully explained when we realize that now that we're at the end of the church age it's me and god every one of us me and god it's not a group of us in god it's me and god we don't have any spiritual overseers elders or deacons who are uh, looking over us, it's me and God, uh, and God speaks to me through his word. Now, he gives us teachers, but the teachers have no spiritual authority. They simply should faithfully declare the word of God 
and the individual is going to receive his blessing not from the teacher but from the word of god okay yeah because it gets confused when it says uh, uh when you got a no uh, to stop congregating uh, so i mean if you go congregate into, into a uh into a church well, you see, it was very difficult for us. Uh, this is a transition. Uh, you know that this was typified by by what happened in in uh, Jerusalem in 587 B.C. Uh, Jerusalem was the holy city. The temple was in Jerusalem. All the promises of God focused on Jerusalem. This was His city. And the ark, the uh, Holy of Holies was there in the temple. And now God tells Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, flee because I'm bringing the Babylonians, that wicked nation against you, to destroy Jerusalem. And you have to get out of the city, otherwise you will be destroyed. And indeed he did uh, bring Babylon there, and they did destroy Jerusalem and did destroy the temple altogether. And so it was a terrible time for those who were wanting to be obedient to God. It was a terrible time that they had to leave their beloved city and flee into wicked Babylon and and uh, and uh, there try to serve God spiritually, even while they were serving Babylon the king of Babylon in a in a secular or in a physical sense. And that's what they were commanded to do. Now we have, have a, a, a parallel situation. We think it's pretty terrible, but really it's nothing to what the Jews went through back there in 587. But here we have been trained all our life to have a comfortable place in a local congregation where we have a fine preacher and we have lots of friends and and we all can uh, be encourage one another that we're all the family of God. We all love the Lord, don't we? And we're all secure in Christ. And, and every Sunday in prayer meeting time on Wednesday night, we can come together smiling and singing together and assuring and reassuring each other. We are safe and secure in the arms of Christ. Now Christ comes and says, wait a minute. Uh, you're, if you remain here, you're going to be spiritually serving Satan. You have to get out. And, and where do I flee to? Is there another church I can go to? No, no. There's no group of people you can flee to. You have to learn to trust only in me. You have to start... Uh, understanding that finally the the real important part of spiritual life is your relationship with God, and that is developed through the Word of God. And so that's something brand new. We hadn't really ever experienced that kind of a thing. And yet this is what God is teaching us. This is what we have to learn to do. We have to look at the Bible with different eyes than we've ever looked at it. This is the law book of God. This is where we're to get our comfort from. This, and, and we are to learn that at any moment we can pray to God for strength and for assurance of salvation and so on. And we can not depend on our fellow man, anybody to reassure us, oh, I know you're a child of God. You have nothing to worry about. We have to get our consolation directly from God through his word, the word of God. And we're not used to that. And yet that is the, that is the story of today. And all over the world, we know there's a great multitude which no man can number that God is saving who are experiencing this personal relationship with God uh, because that is the, the, the way God has set up the whole program in our day. Come to, let's say, you, you tell a, uh, like a friend of mine, if I tell him about Christ and speak to him about Christ, 
I mean, uh, I don't have all the time for myself to explain to him how to follow in Jesus Christ. So now, well, the school they... for this person now that knows about Jesus Christ, where is he going to learn more about Christ? Is where he going to he... put where... all these where... time to look for Jesus, uh, to follow his uh, will? I mean, uh, where is the church standing in? Well, now you see, uh, when during the church age, we would go to our pastor. Or we would go to an elder and say, will you please teach me how to follow Christ? And he would tell, do his best as he understood it to tell us. Now God is saying, no, you don't go there. You go to the Bible. Go directly to the Bible. Uh, we have to become better acquainted reading the Bible. We're not to put our trust in our fellow man of any kind. We're to put our trust only in the Bible. And the Bible is the living Word of God. The Word of God is what God applies to our hearts. Any spiritual blessing doesn't come from the preacher. It doesn't come from the elder. It has to come from God. And so we, we have to learn to go directly to God and depend on Him. And we, at first, are unaccustomed to do that. But we better start start following God's rules and and spending more time in the Word of God and recognizing this is God's Word to me. When I open the Bible and I read a verse in the Bible, that's just not uh, 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 the word that someone like Peter or John or Isaiah wrote. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. Our whole attitude toward the Bible is going to be entirely different. It's going to be one of awe and one of fear and trembling that we might understand as well as possible. It will mean that we are going to be coming far more frequently to God. Oh, Lord, I don't understand. Oh, God, oh, Heavenly Father, help open my spiritual life. Oh, help me to be obedient. Oh, uh, will you, is it possible that you will work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure? And so on. In other words, our dependence is totally upon God. And is, the, is God sufficient? Absolutely He is. The problem is we uh, have not been used to that and we're not certain that it'll work because we're trusting in our own ideas. We're not trusting in the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, brother. Yes. How do you, how do you say your name again? Camping, just like going out in the woods with a tent. Okay, camping. Nice, nice to talk to you. I have a um, sort of like a, a personal issue that I've been uh, dealing with for a while, and I don't know what to do. Now, um, I've been, I'm interested in pursuing a um, just bear with me in pursuing a acting career. Do you think that the Lord um, will be displeased with that because acting is kind of like a form of deception? Well, an acting career. Uh, that's a, a very, very difficult uh, uh, career to follow because, uh, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of drama that is produced and, and really the money makers are not those that are, are trying to be as holy and pure as possible, but those that display sin of various kinds and you as an actor may be acting out uh, the life of uh, of someone in committing this sin or that sin, and how in the world can you, as a true child of God, do that? That's alien to what a true child of God is. Uh, now, it's uh, if if, for example, you were able to pursue an acting career and only had rules roles in which sin was not being magnified in any one what's, a way whatsoever. In, in which uh, God's uh, name would be glorified, that might be one thing, but that would be very difficult uh, to make a living from, I, I, I would think. Because I was thinking that perhaps it would be um, 
uh, okay if I abided by these rules, if I was to act in movie roles, or considering I got to that point, where it would be inspirational movies or movies that will somehow, uh, shape or form, would speak about God or, or you know, uh, maybe how someone's life changed through the Word of God, something like that. A, but there again, you'll find that 99% of the movies you're, of which you're speaking have a man-made gospel. They are teaching a method of salvation or a, uh, that is contrary to the will of God, and you certainly wouldn't want to be a part of that. Uh, and so, again, you see, you're you're beaten right down. Uh, it's uh, uh, you pray for wisdom about this. The very fact that you're asking the question means you have misgivings, and and they may be very uh, very much in place and in order. But you just keep praying for wisdom and ask yourself, now, how can I really glorify God? Because that is the bottom line of every child of God, is that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in acting, if you're acting out a salvation uh, program of some kind, uh, and it is the, the real design of it is a, a man-made gospel, that would absolutely be not to the glory of God. That would be uh, acting out a big, fat lie, and you certainly wouldn't want to do that. And my last question is, um, and this is probably uh, two strange questions, but uh, also what's bothering me is, uh, if you, if someone wanted to take a FDA-approved medication to, say, uh, embellish himself. Say you wanted to lose weight and uh, you wanted to take something to lose weight. Uh, would, would that be wrong if, if it was going to help your self-confidence? Well, you see, when you talk about self-confidence, we have to be really careful because the Bible talks about a true believer as being very humble. And, uh, and self-confidence is a very uh, closely akin to pride. I want to feel good about myself. And the fact is, when we look at the thief or look at the publican coming to God in Matthew, uh, to Luke 18, uh, he smote his breast and he dared not look up. Oh, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. There was no self-confidence there at all. We find our self-confidence not by by uh, physical doing this, physically doing this or doing that. That's simply something that we can do outwardly and, and think we're achieving something. But real, uh, the real place is that we want to find our confidence in Christ. He is our strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is the direction you want to be looking. And, oh, Lord, I... I, I don't trust myself at all. I have to depend entirely that you will give me wisdom. And I know that your wisdom comes through thy word. And, oh, Lord, help me uh, to search thy word and, and, and meditate upon thy word and be obedient to thy word. And then things will start getting in, uh, right in my life. So how come, how come then people take, uh, like, say, if you take, you know, medication for, for a health issue, how come you just don't pray about it and have faith that God will fix it for you and not take the medication, if that's how, if your faith is strong well, enough? I, I, I can't answer for anybody. I don't know, but I know this, that the world has all kinds of, uh, of uh, antidotes uh, or uh, it has medicines for uh, this and that and, and uh, to help but build our confidence to help make us more proud of ourselves, uh, more acceptable to ourselves, and so on. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you. I'm talking about, say you have a, a, a tumor, and they tell you you have to take this medication to get better. What if that person refused the medication and, and, and said, and someone told them, well, if you had enough faith in God and God is capable of doing anything, why not take the medication? Oh, and just well, God we have another matter. God does not frown on any medicine. You know, for example, when, when uh, Hezekiah was dying, uh, God instructed Isaiah to take a cake of fig leaves and put it on the boil. In other words, that is a, an evidence of using medication to heal a man physically. And so God has given us medicines and so on, 
And so we shouldn't hesitate to take medicines. We're not going to get the idea, well, uh, I'm going to look to God for healing and and uh, I'm dying of this or that, and I know that this kind of medicine or that kind of medicine could be very helpful, and I'm not going to take it. That's going contrary to the law of God. We God does give us medicines, but on the other hand, our, tr- tr- our final trust is not in the medicine. It is that God might bless that medicine, that, that God uh, might use that, because a lot of people take medicine that does not cure them, even though it might cure some others with the same disease. And, and so finally God is still there to override whatever, whatever we're doing. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. I had a couple of things. Um, briefly, I know you can only call once a month. Is that a calendar month or is that a, um, you know? Uh, yeah, calendar month. I mean, in other words, if I call a day, could I call like in a couple of days, which would be April, or and then no. not till May, or? <laughs> no, you should call thirty. It's like every thirty about days, About a month roughly. later, about a little, about thirty days later. Right. Okay. Now, um, you have a couple chronology problems, I believe. You date the um, temple in Kings in First Kings six uh, is 967, correct? Yes. Okay. Then you cannot have a jubilee year that ends in seven. I'm sorry. You cannot have a jubilee year that ends in seven. Because it's the 480th year, which means it's 479 years in either one or seven months, depending on which um, year they were using when they be in 967. I'm sorry, 967 is not a jubilee year. That's not a jubilee year. A jubilee year is every in the Old Testament is every year that ended in seven or 57. In other words, uh, 607 was a jubilee year, 657 was a jubilee year, 707 was a jubilee year, 757 was a jubilee year. In the New Testament, as we continue that 50 years, every year that uh, every year that ends in 44 is a jubilee year. Every year that ends in 94 is a jubilee year as we, as we carry that pattern into the New Testament era. But 967 was not a jubilee year. It was not a special year in any way. Uh, because it was not a Sabbath year. It, it was just another year. 480 years until the second month of, four, of uh, 966. You see what I'm saying? It's only 479 years gone by. Well, the Israel came out of Egypt in 1407 B.C. Okay, and if they came out in 1407, then the then the um, no, temple would have had me, to be. Excuse me, 1447. They came out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt in 1440. Oh, well, I'll have to. Let's continue our conversation because we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.